if you want to. I'm not ready for that. Hey everyone, I'm Chef Dennis and welcome to day two of the third annual Virtual Bloggers Conference and today in this session we're talking about visual strategies because a picture is worth a thousand words and in this day and age it might even be worth a little bit more. Those are that those are not inflated uh, quotes, so it's probably worth 10,000 words at least. Mm -hmm. But we have four of the most visually active people that I know on the internet, and I'm going to introduce them to you right now, and then we're going to get started. If you have questions, leave them in the comments section, and we will hopefully get to them. So starting on my left, I have Rebecca Radice. How are you doing? Terrific. How are you? Great, and I'm glad your team got everything set up. There were, you, you missed a flurry <laughs> of hands and handing yeah. cups and everything in the green room as they, they got Rebecca ready. So thank you so much. The magic that goes on behind the scenes, right? I know, I know. So I'm, I'm very happy to have you here, and we're going to start talking in a little bit. And then coming to us from the East Coast is Peg Fitzpatrick. Hello, it's afternoon here. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. You're on Florida time too, so we're we're both uh, afternoon ready for lunch kind of people right now. Uh, Definitely. Because it's still coffeeing it up, although I have it too. So thank you so much for coming out today. I have I haven't had any caffeine today. This is me with no caffeine. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, <laughs> That's why I don't always even drink coffee. True story. I'm a little oh. hyper. Uh, a, a visual graphic for coffee that said, what would I do without you? Probably 25 to life. So, <laughs> coffee important. Yeah. And they're coming to us from Texas. We have Jeff C. How you doing, buddy? Good. Just a minute. I got to I gotta talk to my team. Hey, can you bring me some pants? That's important. <laughs> I thought this was no pants. Yeah, oh. wait a second. That's what the invite said. Well, it's it's Sunday in Texas, and part of Sunday in Texas. Is yeah. You go to church, you got to wear pants. That's right. We're very legalistic here. So. No, you thanks for having. Holy, you have to wear your holy pants. My holy pants. That's right. Thanks for having me on, Chef. I, I love your your conference every year, and so being on here with these ladies is is going to be awesome. So. Ah, I know. I know. It's so much fun. And then going back over to the West Coast, we've got Andrea Beltrami. How you doing, Andrea? What's up? Like I said, I'm still a little bit half asleep, but I'm excited to be here. And I'm loving the hat action, even though it is just for hair. It's looking pretty sweet. I know. It's functional and fashionable. What? It's always a good nice. thing. <laughs> Very cool. So hopefully we'll wake you up with the presentation. And, uh, Absolutely. Thanks so much for being here, and let's let's get this party started. And, and somebody wants to kick it off, let's talk about the reasonings behind uh, visual strategies and uh, whoever wants to start. <laughs> Everybody jump in. Visual strategy. Visual strategy. Well, I'll talk okay. about it right here. Okay. okay. All right. So, I'm just going to say that I always say that, okay, we're, we're all told we have these seven or eight seconds to grab someone's attention. Visuals, frankly, increase that by leaps and bounds. Instead of, you know, that seven to eight seconds, you have every single time that you appear in someone's feed. And if you're consistent, you got your brand dialed in. That is that far exceeds the seven to eight seconds that you know you typically have. Visuals just continue a relationship, and they build on every time they're seen. And, and to add what Andrea said, um, it, it's it's really the only way you can get noticed on social media these days. There's just a flood of content on every social platform. So if you don't have something that's in, that is interesting, impressive, entertaining, colorful, you know, like whatever you're going for, we'll talk about more about why you would choose different things for your strategies. But uh, if you, that's, I'll tell you uh, my background story in Google Plus. I was on Google Plus. I didn't know anybody at all on Google Plus. Um, like everybody else, you know, well, actually, I knew Guy Kawasaki, that's it. Um, the one person on Google Plus. None of my friends were on there. So, and I went on, and I took. It took me like a year to really start getting traction with my blog, and it took me all this time to figure out how can I get people interested in my blog because nobody was interested in reading a blog post on Google+. It was a lot of really techie people. It was a lot of like lighter, fluffy content. Nobody was interested in clicking, so I kept messing around with my formula and my perfect post formula, which I have shared you know, on Google+, Plus before, includes a big image. It includes a bold title and italicized 
place title, a little snippet, and some hashtags. Almost everybody posts on Google Plus like that now, but honestly, it took me at least a year, and Rebecca knows because she was, you know, following along with me. I was like, hey, I tried hashtags at the bottom, and it worked. And, you know, it was all experimentation, but none of the rest of it works without a big image. And I do sacrifice, you know, according to some of the SEO people, I sacrifice something by not embedding my link. But if I embed a link even with the same exact image, it doesn't get interaction. So, uh, you know, you can choose to work for more SEO, but if nobody looks at your post, what's the point? Well, and that's the conversation we have all the time is, you know, everybody's goal is different, but still at the end of the day, engagement is a key component to taking people from, and we're all bloggers here, um, or content creators, it's taking people from your Google Plus profile and moving them over to your website. And the only way, I, is, to your point, Peg, the only way we're getting seen these days is to have a branded, consistent look and feel that people identify with immediately. And I think that's what those larger I images uh, do for people is, you know, there's just so much content coming at you and they can just instantly know, oh, that's Peg's, you know, that's Peg's content. I know this is going to be great content, so I know I want to click through. So I just think there's so many different benefits mm -hmm. to getting visual, using those consistent visuals in not only it being that connector uh, that people just instantly identify with, um, but helping you kind of cut through all the noise that's going on out there. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, I and I would have to say that added to you being sorry, Jeff, um, to you being you know winning the top ten um, blogs for Social Media Examiner. People know and love your blog. Um, did you write great content the year before we figured out all of this stuff? Yes, you did, because I read it. But when we look back on our older posts, because Rebecca and I do a lot of analysis, our older posts will have like 100 shares, and our current posts will have 1,500 shares. What makes the difference? I argue that it's visuals. Yeah, I, well, I, I, and thank you. But yes, I would, I would completely agree. I think it was uh, definitely us finding that groove, so to speak, and finding that personal branding that worked for us. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's a, a, an area where so many people are still missing, and I know all four of us have talked about this uh, on our blogs, which is not carrying your branding through from one social network to the next from your blog. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think people are still really missing that opportunity to take that, you know, for example, you've got your logo right there um, that you use on all of your images, that pink, instantly identifiable, uh, your signature. So you've got to find something that just screams you, that mm -hmm. says, this, this is me and this is what I'm all about. Um, I know you mentioned, you know, really tying your graphics into uh, your personality and that's your brand personality and so it's figuring out you know what works for you what doesn't uh, and then just continuing to allow that to evolve I know all of us have played around with what works and um, what doesn't uh, and and so it's you know giving yourself I guess the freedom to be able to really figure out what does feel right for you mm -hmm. absolutely and I was just going to add that, you know, people spend so much time creating great content with their blogs. Why don't they, they just need to take it and spend that much time creating a great image because of all the reasons you have said. So many people get almost to the finish line and then stop. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they spend all that time writing that great post and they don't put that image to it. Um, the other thing I would say is, yeah, visuals for me, that's the only reason I'm on this panel or yeah. any of the success I I've had on Google Plus. I was wondering why Jeff was here. <laughs> <laughs> That. I'm just kidding, Jeff. I love Jeff. I have to say, I will announce now. I love Jeff, and I like to harass Jeff. So carry it does, on. It but <laughs> it's because of you know the videos uh, I've done in the past, and then uh, my branding. Uh, which, if you go back and look at my earlier pins and stuff, it's horrible. I mean, you can see, and I show in a presentation that I do where. I was trying to find my style, and you can see that. And and I even use Rebecca and Peg's post because you can see the same way too. That the, how they're always experimenting and always trying new things and always changing it, trying to dial it in. And so, 
you don't really ever just throw something up and be happy with it. You continually test it and try new things and see what works better, more traction. So those are all good points that you guys said. Well, and I was going to say, I think, it, it, Jeff, what is your background? Do you have design experience? No, I'm all self-taught. Um, okay. I've been doing it for so long with, uh, I mean, I use a mixture of Photoshop and Canva and whatever other tools. Um, and so I always tell people I'm not a graphic designer. I'm a compositor. I can take different things and I put them together. I, I, to me, a designer is somebody who can take a blank page and an illustrator create all this stuff. I yeah. I move stuff together uh, is kind of what I think of myself. So I do the same that, thing. That's what I do, that's what I do too. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I've had people say, "Oh, Jeff, you're such a great photographer," and I say, "No, I'm a great stock photographer." You know. <laughs> and the thing is, and and we all I think have learned this is, we use a lot of free stock photography, but we know how to throw a filter on it or crop it or change it up a little bit. So our Canva post doesn't look like everybody else Canva post. Does that make sense? And mm -hmm. I think that's a skill that has to be learned as you go along. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah for sure. It's, uh, it, yeah, I look back at the, some of my early stuff, it's painful, you know. <laughs> I, I, I think everybody is like that. Yeah. Like, trying to figure out what looks good on Pinterest, I have done that. I was like, this is the best thing I've ever made. And when I look at it, it's literally embarrassing, but the pin has lots of repins, so there it sits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are there different strategies for the different social media out there? Mm -hmm. I have a screen share. You guys can talk. Let me turn this on because I think this might help a little bit if I can do this here. Do you know how to screen share? I do. See, look at that. Woo! Look at you. This is what I do for every post. Yeah. My yeah. Pin, you see my pin over there on the left-hand side, yeah. and then in the middle is my kind of social media post, and then I have a Twitter header post that I use for all my tweets about that thing, and then mm -hmm. on the right is Instagram. And so... You know, we all know how to do this, and this is a skill that's learned too, is repurposing. How to repurpose content, or you will go crazy. Mm -hmm. And I learned this from Rebecca and from Peg, uh, watching them, because they're always doing this this stuff. And this is what I do, and I use I use uh, social warfare on my blog to tell people what to pin. I think we, I think we all do. Yeah, we all do. Four of us. All fans. <laughs> and it's the visual component of that. That's why um, I do the same. I use the same image sizes that Jeff does. One uh, really cool program that I don't know if you guys have tried, or it's not even a program. It's just a website called Optimal Pics. If you are only using a photo, you can upload the photo once into Optimal Pics, and it will crop the photo to all the sizes that Jeff just showed. So that's no design. That's just photos. So if you're um, Chef Dennis, and you just whipped up a spinach salad with strawberries and poppy seed dressing because that sounds good right now. Um, <laughs> you could make you you could take one fantastic photo of it. You're not going to add any text overlay at all. Maybe it's a teaser for a bigger blog post. Optimal dot pics um, and it one size it's like because a lot of complaints that I hear from people are like are you kidding I have to do four sizes I have to do two sizes I'm like well I'm sorry but social media sites make us do that you know you can't take a Pinterest graphic and have it look good on Facebook Google Plus is the most forgiving lovely site they let you do any size you want you can you know and they, they it all looks good they never make it look bad or weird but they are the only one um, so Optimal Pix is a great one to play around with if you're just doing photos and you just upload it once and you do all the sizes, all the sizes are perfect because I gave them the numbers to use. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's that's just a quick way. If you're not somebody who wants to mess around with a lot of design, you know, you can still, using the right size is the first step in visual strategy to make sure, be, and another thing I always tell bloggers is you need to make sure that your posts look good when other people share it. It's not only when you share it. Um, if you if you share it and it looks great, okay, that's fine, but when Andrea comes to my blog and she goes to share it on Facebook and there's no featured image, is she going to share that? No, Absolutely. I mean, you you have to you have to test your blog, and that's where social war warfare is amazing because you can load all your different size photos, and you know, would other people share it? It looks good, but if you don't use something like that, you still you know the minimum is Facebook open graph 
photo. Um, so and and then putting on your Twitter cards and things. And I know those things are a little tricky. You can hire Jeff, and Jeff will do those things for you. <laughs> I'll just I'll look him Jeff everywhere. But there are some things that people don't want to mess around with. If you don't know how to do plugins, if you're, you know, there's there's ways that you can work with other people to help you create a visual visual strategy. And I know Andrea's worked with a lot of people. Um, helping them create a logo so they can add it on things, doing a color palette. You know, you can do these things yourself and experiment, or you can hire someone. And it's not thousands and thousands of dollars. I, I can say, I mean, I'm I'm not doing it, so maybe it is thousands of dollars if you hire some people. But if you're a blogger, there are definitely reasonably priced people that you can work with that that will understand blogging and and look for ask for people's um, portfolios and say, have you worked with bloggers? Because there is a difference between design and social media and blogging design. There's a very big difference. And some designers that may be amazing graphic designers don't really get how things need to look on social media. Like They don't really know how the logo is going to be teeny tiny on Twitter. Um, maybe we should talk about logos. And, do you want to talk about logos? Let's do it, buddy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's talk about how important your logo is to your visual strategy. Because, like, I think it really starts with your logo and your brand palette. Do you guys agree? Absolutely. Well, and that's the thing. I don't think enough people. I mean, this day and age, blogging isn't about you just write content and throw it out there. I mean, if you want to mm -hmm. be a blogger, it 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 means as much to the writing side as it does the visual side. Like, so for mm -hmm. me, I'm a visual girl, and the visuals are really easy for me. The writing is a struggle, but guess what? If mm -hmm. I want to be a blogger, I've got to go out there and learn how to write, especially a, a, in a blogging type format. You mm -hmm. got to do the same thing with visuals, and it starts like Paige just said with like defining the quintessential things. Like all four of us have a very uh, recognizable color palette. We have very recognizable elements like our logos on our images, and that's where it starts. It doesn't have to be complicated, but you have to invest the time. Like it, mm -hmm. it's just the way it goes. You're not going to make uh, you're not going to make the mark and stand out online, like you said, if you don't get the visual dialed in. And the right. logo, I always say, is like it's the visual path back to your solutions. Like if mm -hmm. it gets, uh, you know, uh, unlinked from your actual content or it's stolen or whatever, like the logo tells people exactly who gives the credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. And not enough people understand that. Like throwing your, you know, URL and some text, tiny little text at the bottom is not it. Like mm -hmm. missing the mark there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I think along with the logo, maybe we can talk a little bit about too. You, you mentioned it, Andrea, and um, I, I just think you have done such a great job with your color palette, with nailing down that look so that, it, especially if I'm over on Pinterest, I mean, my goodness, your boards are just beautifully designed around that. Oh, so I, it, it just bleeds into everything you do. Um, right. Maybe let's talk a little bit about how do you get started defining um, what is important uh, and kind of creating a template for yourself so you simplify uh, the whole idea of creating these graphics. Um, maybe speak to what's important, you know, the typography. What do you have to figure out that is going to carry through in everything that you do? Right, well, uh, that's defining the branding guidelines. And I think two of the most important things and the most important things that I carry through everything I do is that color palette and my typography. So my color palette is the charcoals and the yellow. Every single thing you see me do has that color palette. But here's the thing. What I did was take my color palette, which mine's very sort of monotone with that pop of yellow, but I just I assigned and defined every color in my color palette. So it's like the, the background is always going to be charcoal. The, the typography is always going to be white or yellow. My call to actions are always going to be yellow. When it comes to, to creating color palettes, it's a lot more than just picking some pretty colors that you like. It's about deciding how you're going to use those colors and how they're going to be implemented. So what you use in your image should match what you use on your blog. And I think all of us do that. Like you mentioned, we all use social warfare, but if you go and look at each one of our sites, we have different colors, we have different shapes, we brand it, which is the epicness, besides how you can control your sharing, of social warfare. But mm -hmm. if you look, we've all 
infused our brand palette into it. We put that action color. They're all famous for Peg's got the pink, Rebecca's got the orange. Um, that's a, the start of it. And then the other is the fonts, the typography. Mm -hmm. Use the same thing on the blog that you're using on your images. And, and keep it consistent. Like you said, I think all of us tweak and we evolve. And I've seen all of our images. And I've seen how we've tried different stuff. And, uh, but we've all stayed consistent with the color palette mm -hmm. and the fonts and, and the, the foundational stuff. And I think that's where you have to start is you have to start defining. And that takes tweaking and playing and it's going to take work and practice. And like you said, Peg, there might be, you know, a round where you hate it and you move on and, and you mm -hmm. craft and hone from there. But you yeah. have to start there. You have to start playing somewhere and you have to define those things and then use them in everything you do. And, and essentially, it's I always tell people two colors, maybe three, right? You never want to go more than that for your brand. You want to keep no. it, you could, maybe even one to two, right? I mean, well, I always do. I always say there's one action color, so that should be all your links and your buttons and everything mm -hmm. that you know you want to draw attention to. Then there's a background color, and then there's an accent color. Like that's mm -hmm. it. And then you've got your you know your white, your black, or your blue or gray or whatever you know your dark text is. Mm -hmm. But that's just for background, so white background, you know, very, very dark, whether that's a brown, black, or blue. Uh, and then you just have those three colors, and you use mm -hmm. them consistently. And like, mm -hmm. I, I think all of us have that one accent color that we're totally famous for. When you see mm -hmm. it in feeds, you immediately think of one of us, because we have stuck to it and, and created that one color that's very iconic with our brand. Yeah, I, I just recently had a couple of people that are like t straight up stealing my blog style and they literally like used my own tips against me and did that. They've done the little eyedropper and taken my paint to use for their, and I'm like, no, that's not creating an original brand, people. Yeah. That's the, the main, most important element of your brand is that you create something that's unique to you. It's yeah. awesome if you like my orange or Andrea's gold or Rebecca's orange. And yes, we don't own those colors. I totally get that. But we are very well branded. So if you go, if I look on your blog and you've copied my circle elements and you've used my exact pink, you know, it, it's not original and, and it's not you. That's me, I created those things. So you need yep. to like create the you, whether it's a different shade of pink. I mean, everybody says my pink is like super pink. It's honestly really close to red. If you looked at it on the color wheel, it's, I didn't want like a super girly pink. It's actually, it looks so pink, but it's really close to a red. I just didn't want to do like a bold red, but I wanted a bold color. There's like reasons why I picked it. You need to find those elements that are you and pick the color that fits with, you know, what your brand is who you are, what you want to do. Um, Jeff d does a, a, a bright red on his and it's awesome and it shows up and it's bold and you know red is the most like you know it's energetic and bold and bright so you have to find things that match with what your brand is that that's where your color fits in. Um, like I, Andrea's got gold. What does that make you think of? Money. <laughs> she, what, she's out there looking for clients you know she's like if you wanted like solid gold brand, bam, you know, like Andrea will create one for you. <laughs> Colors tell you things. Yellow, yeah. yellow yeah. is energetic and bright, but gold is money. You know, yeah. like we, whether you know it or not, colors relay a ton of information, whether it's movies, literature, whatever it is, you know, Andrea has all white on. She would be the hero, right? Because the, the heroes always wear white and the, the villains wear black and the <laughs> The bad girl's gonna wear bright red. I mean, like, there's colors tell stories that that are there when you're not there. So um, that's why choosing choosing all those things that match who you are, what your brand is, what your messaging is. You know, there's a reason that tons and tons of the blo the internet is blue. Um, blue, blue is the color of the brain. If you're going for a job interview, you want to wear blue because people trust blue. Um, you know that's why men wear navy blue suits when they, you know, if there's, it's it's amazing. But there's a lot of color theory, and it's interesting to research. So when you're looking to create your brand, look up all those things and and see what they mean because you are relaying a message. Rebecca's orange is orange is the most energetic and bright, and it's not a very used color and 
but it's um, it's got a lot of really special qualities to it. So like you have to think of all these things, and if you really honestly are don't have any idea of what we're talking about at all, hire someone. Hire someone to consult and create these things for you. They you can explain to them who you are, what you do, and they can do these things for you. You can say, I hate this color, I don't like this color. You know, you might pick a color that you think is amazing that would look horrible on all of social media, and hopefully the person you work with will tell you that's not a you know not a good color choice. It's not going to show up. So there are instances where you can do everything yourself in your visual strategy strategy and there's some places where it's good to invest some money and hire someone to create a logo hire someone to create a brand palette for you um, you can have someone create brand style guide for you and then you can implement that working with someone if you can't design at all there's tons of courses that you can take like on lynda.com and other places where you can like teach yourself how to do things so um, while we're all talking about experimenting, we did that, but we also learned different things from other, you know, as we went along. And a lot of it's, you know, you get your 10,000 hours in and, you know, it gets easier. It gets better. And I still am not a Photoshop user. I have Photoshop. I have the whole Adobe suite. But I don't, what I don't have is the time to invest to figure out what all those buttons mean. <laughs> and I know that I can make something great using other things, so that works for me. Mm. Um, I, and well, and Peg, let me say real quick, I think, I think this is such a critical point. Um, what I always ask people is, what do you have more of, time or money? And you really have to figure out what are your money-making activities within your business. And if you don't have time, uh, I look at things all day long and go, I have no business working on this. Give it away. Give it away. Give it away. Give it away. Because it's the only way <laughs> you're going to stay focused Rebecca on in the red hat your business. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I started singing that in my head. I'm, I, okay, so I, anyway. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm in the middle of redesigning my blog, and it's going to be uh, charcoal, orange, and pink. And, um, <laughs> the winning combination. I, I would say charcoal and pink would be fabulous. <laughs> But yeah, you know, it is. I mean, it is a struggle. I mean, you, you talked about a little bit of logo, and the thing that's one of the things giving me my the most traction is my manly Pinterest tip logo. But one of the things I think is important when you're when you're talking about this, and and Jody Oaken had a question about rebranding, mm -hmm. um, is it's important to have people who will uh, talk to you and give you honest feedback. Yes. Like when I did my first logo, it was horrible. It had the beard guy on it, but it was this ugly blue, like somebody was choking a Smurf. I mean, it was horrible. And one of my Let's friends. Said, no, I don't know where it's at. It was horrible. He it, was burned horrible. It. it was horrible. And, and I asked people, I said, what do you think? And they're like, well, I like this. Why don't you try red? And that's what it became. And so, but also, you've got to know when to take advice and when to let it go. Because one person said, I don't take away that gradient off your beard, the white thing at the bottom. And I said, that's me. That's my brand. I'm not going to do that. And so. Yeah. Taking, being able to collaborate with other people, I mean, I'm always sending pins to Peg and say, what do you think about this? And she'll send stuff to me, and I do the same with Rebecca. And, and having that group, once you start networking, is invaluable to make your brand better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's funny that you bring that up, because everybody I talk to, uh, when I rebranded and went to Orange many years ago, said, oh, Orange is terrible, it's off-putting. Um, it, people are going to hate it. Nobody's using it. And as soon as somebody says nobody's using it, I'm like, ha ha, then I'm going to. Um, I'm totally going to own that color, especially if you tell me I can't or I shouldn't. <laughs> and it's been, I think, one of the best branding decisions I ever made. I, I personally love the color. So it, it really represents who I am. Uh, so I think that's a great point, Jeff, because there's, there is that fine line of taking people's uh, advice or feedback and filtering that through what you know to be true about your business and your brand. Um, does it feel right to you? Does it look like you? And does it tell your story? And we haven't talked about that yet. Um, but I know we're all just huge advocates of allowing your brand to tell your story. 
Uh, and I think we've all done a, a great job with that. I was going to say remarkable, but then it sounds like I'm patting myself too much on the back. But you all have done a remarkable job <laughs> with, with allowing your branding to tell your, your business story. And I would ask all of us a question because this, I think, is probably something a lot of entrepreneurs, small business owners ask as they're kind of walking through this process, which is, did you know completely what your story was going to be and how your branding would be impacted by that when you first started um, this whole journey? Or and, and if you didn't, how did you get there and figure it out? Hmm. This is, a, a, if you can see my screen share, I, I used this for a presentation the other day on my show. But like I think all of these show great examples, and, and yes, mine is in there um, about telling a story because Rebecca's. I mean, she, her one with the rocket tells a really good story, and then Ashley uh, Fox from Mad Lemmings, his you know he always uses kind of funny, odd images, but they tell a story, and I think those are some good examples of you know. He does such a good job with his text too. Yeah, yeah. he does. Yeah. It's just awesome. But anyway, I just wanted to throw those up. Of when you're talking about images that tell a story, I thought these mm -hmm. were good, some great examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, and I I think you you've kind of answered that question, Jeff. It was an evolution for you. You didn't necessarily know the story that your branding was going to tell, um, but you have definitely figured it out and found it. And it, it sounds like you did a lot of that with trial and error and and asking people, just asking for their feedback. And a lot of failure. A lot of bad pins. <laughs> yeah. Then they are well, done that. <laughs> you know, and, and, and a good uh, something that's good to note too when you're working with someone, if they really are not getting your brand at all and you're not happy with it, then you need to work with someone different because if you get a brand that you don't love, you have to look at it for a really long time on your blog. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Or wherever. So, you know, make sure that you, if you're going to choose to work with someone, you know that you that they're asking you questions like Rebecca was just saying. You want them to be able to ask you all the things. Maybe and here's the other thing: you might not know all the answers yourself, but they should be able to tease that out of you and to figure out what your brand is, even though you won't know what your brand is. Other people can sometimes boil it down better than you can for yourself. Well, yeah, I was going to say. The majority of the time, people can. I think so often we are so close to it that there's a lot of emotion tied up into it and it can become that situation where we're just picking stuff we like instead of stuff that actually uh, is representative of who our business is but also mm -hmm. speaks to uh, those potential clients that we want to bring in. So yeah, I think getting somebody else that really understands those questions to ask is so critical. Mm -hmm. Sorry Andrea, yeah. I stepped on you. That's okay. <laughs> No, I was just going to add that I actually get a lot of clients that, you know, want to hire me to create their brand identity, but the thing is when we jump in, they're not ready for that. They're, they don't have the information and they haven't done the soul searching to get mm -hmm. in touch with them and themselves enough that I have anything to work with. So a lot of mm -hmm. times they're, they're really surprised that I push back and, and say, no, 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 we're at the discovery phase, sister or brother. You know, mm -hmm. we have to start back with answering the questions and figuring out what you want your visuals to evoke, what your brand stands for, what your, right. what's your personality. I think a lot of times, like Rebecca said, I think sometimes we're really close to things and it's hard to have a fresh set of eyes, but I think a lot of times people aren't in touch with that. We come from this very business place of like, well, branding is this separate thing and you know we have to come from this marketing mindset and this hypey salesy this, this stuff that's not the personal side and just as much as visuals are so huge to stand out these days so is being a unique person and leading mm -hmm. with your personality and leading with who you are as a person and that's got to be infused in your brand and I think too many times there's a very big divide in that for people and I have so many clients that do that and then, then once I force it and push it like Pig said really draw it out of them, then it's like the light clicks for them and, and they're blown away about how much clearer they are about exactly what they want than when we started. But there, there is a big push like everybody wants to be a blogger and everyone wants to be famous on the internet. So there are people who are just like, I want to blog. Do you write? No. Which, you know, that doesn't mean you can't be a blogger because a lot of people learn as they go. But, you know, yeah, right. Or learn how to design as they go. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
So, but but you do need to have some plan figured out of what you're going to do. Like there is there is a lot that comes before getting to the visual strategy part. But this yeah. we're just talking about that part. But you're exactly right. Um, your designer is not a you know. Um, they don't have a crystal ball and they can't create your whole, you know, business for you. You you create your business and then, you know, then you're going the other way. Or or, or even if you're just a personal blogger, you know, you don't it doesn't have to be a business, but um, you yeah, know, well, I and I think I think a lot of times that's going to be two different people, don't you think? A, a mm -hmm. lot of times your designer is not going to have the experience to ask those questions, Andrea, that you were talking about. You know what? Yeah. You've really got to get to the core of of who you are. What what does your brand stand for? What is your brand promise? What uh, what are those that object that defines you or the words that describe you, um, so that you can start to get to that place where you were talking about, Andrea, where you clearly understand who your company is, what your company is all about, what a great representation of your company would look like so then you can take that information and relay that to your designers so that they they can understand, they can see your vision. I work with somebody every day and he is an absolute genius when it comes to design and we work so well together and I think it's my ability to clearly understand what I'm trying to convey to him mm -hmm. and then he just sees it and he takes it and he runs with it and to have that relationship I think the only way you can do that is to really know who you are and I think that's the biggest problem that I see and I, I would be willing to bet you guys do too is people jump into starting a business they're off and running things are great and they never really figured out uh, what their business is all about in the online world. So taking that time to take a step back and really figure out what do I stand for? Who am I? What kind of message am I wanting to convey? Who is my target audience? All those terribly important questions that a lot of time I think we just zoom past uh, and then we wonder why social media isn't working, why you know we're not getting any interaction or engagement. And ninety, probably nine percent of the time, it all comes down to you haven't answered all of those questions. Mm. I think too. I mean, <laughs> I thought it was funny, you know, having the designers trying to figure out what you want. It was so easy with Peg. She had like a card she wrote out <laughs> to me. It's such so easy working. She goes, I, I want I this bad, now. Bad. I want yeah. this. <laughs> that was good. But um, the other thing I would think about too is um, when you're creating visuals is consistency. Even if you're not, you know, we talked we talked a lot about testing and going out and continuing to, you know, try new things. But also, we are making a blog image for every post. I mean, we're we are. It's consistent. It's all the time. It's it's even if you're you're trying to figure out your style, it's being consistent. Don't you're not just going to make one image and that's it. I mean, it's if not if. Uh, great images are, are kind of the price what it takes to come sit at the table now on social media. You just have mm -hmm. to do that. So mm -hmm. uh, consistency. I see a lot of people almost get to the finish line and, and stop and to continue to crank out those images and keep working on it. On that note, we have a question here from Julie. Uh, Julia, as you've all discovered things that don't work as far as photos go, can you share a few examples of what types of images didn't fly? Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. For me, um, uh, it's using actual human beings <laughs> within pictures. So stuff that looks really stock photo-y, um, but also staying away from faces or just really any visuals for the most part. There's a couple of times where they've worked for me, but there was a lot of filtering, uh, different looks around that. Um, so that was a that was a big one. My look is far more. I lean towards you know the vectors, um, just a, a very different look in that sense. Um, but stock photos, I bet we would all agree. Um, you know, if you're just looking for a, a situation where your standard look, average look, is the same as everybody else's, then stick with stock. But if you want to stand out, as we're talking about, you're going to have to move away from that or at least have the ability to take that stock photo, kind of like what we've been talking about here, uh, and turn it into something that's unique to you. 
I, I use almost all stock photography, which is funny. Which we, like, we all do, but you wouldn't yeah. know that. Well, yeah, but, but I was going to add to like why another t reason why it works, though, is because I pick things that have a pop of pink in it or that really match my brand. I also will use turquoise, you know. So think about what your brand looks like and picking photos that kind of fit what you do. Um, use you know you can use abstract things you could always add uh, canvas really great for being able to go in and ch you can create a certain brand filter and you could use that brand filter code on every single photo so they all have the same little tint you know whether you know if I wanted to be like super pink which I don't you know I could put a, like a very light pink um, filter over all of them or I could blur them all to a, the same exact amount so you can take different photos and make give them all similar qualities that's it seems like it's really advanced but it's not, it's not as hard as you think it is and here's uh, here's a screen share of what Peg was talking about um, on Canva if you go to the filter and then the advanced filter options there's a little hack hex tag and once you get it drilled in the way you want it you can copy and paste that to Evernote or Notepad and use that same filter all the time and so that's the screen share of where that is right there Nice. Uh, yeah, that sure does. It, well, it's it's kind of back to what we were talking about, about creating that template, that look that you use over and over and over again. So when, you know, we talk branding, a lot of people, your eyes glaze over and you think, oh my God, this is totally overwhelming. But in, in reality, it makes your life a hundred times easier. It really does. When yeah. You never have to think about what color code to use or what... You know, what font to pick, and I have to say that's yeah. one thing, that was the one part of Rebecca's brand that took actually the longest. Her her final piece of the puzzle was finding the right font. It's it's crazy how something that seems like it, you don't think about it that often because once you have it there, it's in place, bam, it's done. But you know, you experiment and I, you you'll hit like the magic image, and everybody will be like, "This is amazing." And you're like, "Okay, so it had that <laughs> font, and it was this, and you know, and there's there it is, boom, you know." What, what do you guys think about, uh, we kind of touched on a little bit, um, different things work, diff different images look, work better on different platforms. Like uh, Rebecca mentioned a little bit, you know, faces didn't really work for her. But, you know, sometimes faces work better on Instagram. And so what I'm trying to do is find a medium that it kind of works good on all platforms. Like mine's the retro kind of font with on a, ba a cool background or something like that. So that's also something to think about as well when you're thinking about branding because you want to go across all the, so at least I do, across all the social media networks. Right. Well, yeah. I think one of the, to answer the, the question that was asked, I think another thing that I see a lot of people struggle with is how to put the text on an image so that it's actually mm -hmm. readable. And I think the best tip and trick for that, and I think it's something that a lot of us uh, on this panel use, is an overlay. So putting, like, like Peg uses that pink transparent band and puts a title over that in a lot of her images. Putting some sort of color. If you're using stock photography, a lot of times slapping on a white or black or red or whatever font is horrible. It's not readable and again, like if you're not going to create a, a, a awesome visual, it's not going to help. Just to have a visual period isn't isn't right. the win. It's <laughs> it's having it so it's readable and devourable and aesthetically pleasing. And part of you that is probably making sure. You should what? repeat that again. You should just repeat that phrase again. Just yes. having an image is not, not the a win. win. Exactly. Yeah. It's not. It's not about just like, I have a visual, it's there, the text is on there. Like, no. You have to, mm -hmm. it has to be readable. And mm -hmm. uh, that, again, create the template. Play around and figure out what it is that works. But an overlay is a great way. It's a great way to make stock photography your own by infusing, you know, some color from your color palette, and it's a great way to be able to put text on an image in a way that is readable and pleasing. So, I would and, also some, sometimes you pick an image that ends up not working. <laughs> yeah, um, you do have to sometimes play around with the image. Sometimes you can fit your text around the image, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can do. An, I kind of do both, depending on if I really fall in love with an image that fits the post. I always yeah. write my post first. Like come up with my title, then I write my post, then I do all my graphics when I'm done, 
because I want it to fit everything else that I've done. It's like the frosting and the sprinkles, you know. I want it to fit everything. So I might really love a photo, but I might not be able to get it to work. Yep. So I then I can't use that for anything with text. I maybe would just put it in the post somewhere if I really loved it and it fit. But you can't you can't take every photo and add text to it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm That's sorry, Jeff, cool. I didn't mean to interrupt, but <laughs> No, I was just gonna say another thing is is make sure your images and the text looks good on mobile because more yeah. and more people every day are coming to your site through those mobile devices. And if you use those really scripty fonts that may look yeah. great on your on your screen uh, when it's on your phone they can't read that and you know you, I, I have to, I always have struggled with oh mobile mobile I've got to, I have to put that in the front of my mind like Jay Bear says mm -hmm. think mobile first and so uh, that's another important tip mm -hmm. too here's a question from uh, Jody Oakham she's she's been talking about her I guess her recognition for faces and she wants to know she does use Getty images but I add my brand add-ons to help uh, color filter font, but she's having a problem with not using faces. Uh, so it might else? actually work for Jody's brand though, because Jody yeah. has a financial. She does kind of college financial aid, so she works with like millennials and <laughs> college, you know, college funding. Her images actually really do work with her brand uh, because she's she wants to reach people to pull them in as as clients. So I think her. Her faces actually work with her brand. Rebecca's brand, you know, she's a blogger writing about social media. You know, unless every picture is going to have someone holding a smartphone or working in a laptop, <laughs> you know, it, there's not good. There's not. I mean, I have to say, I probably have some in mind. There's just it's hard to work faces in in a logical way for certain brands. I think Jody, it actually works for her brand. Yeah, I would agree with that because that that is your market, Jody. You're you're trying to connect with a very specific group of people. So through using those kind of images, you could speak to the you know the 18 year olds, 17 year olds that are getting ready to make that decision to go off to college. Um, you could probably even get a little edgy um, because that's going to speak to a younger demographic. So it is you know again, it's all under understanding your brand and what works for you and yeah you know faces just don't work for me um, but that doesn't mean they're not going to work for your business and so it's it's really clearly identifying uh, who your target market is and I speak so much about this because to me it is just such a critical foundation piece um, too many people you know I say who is your target market and if you say everybody you are totally missing a huge opportunity you've got to drill down into you know for example if you were to say to me well uh, oh, that's that's unfortunate uh, really broad and huge because as you can imagine a mom of a toddler and a mom of a teenager very different situation, very different uh, scenario that goes on within their life on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, one is chasing a kid around and dealing with um, just all of the activity that goes on with that. The other one, maybe they're just learning how to drive. They're just learning how to uh, mm -hmm. do things really on their own as human beings. They're learning how to get out there and uh, interact with people on a very adult level so it, it's very different conversations that are going on and if you don't really understand what your niche is uh, I think it's going to be hard to speak to them I think it's going to be almost impossible then to translate that into a visual brand that really connects with them but I, I do think it works for Jody. And as a, another example, um, one of Jody's best friends, Sharon Greenthal, she writes about um, she writes for empty nesters. And again, images work really well because you're talking about specific demographics, certain people. You know, they're the you know they're a little bit older. You know, not old, but a little bit older. You're, they're not millennials, but they're moms of millennials. So you want the images to speak to the different demographics. I think that people in photos can. Work Work really well for those type of brands. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's just that trial and error, test, 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 and figure mm -hmm. out what does well for you. And to Jeff's point, then find something that is universal across all social networks that it does really well. 
no matter where people find you, and that you keep it consistent. So again, as we've talked so much about, as people are finding you on Google+, Plus or over on Twitter, or on Facebook, no matter where they see you, they just instantly know that it's you, and that that content came from you, and it's that, that trust, that rapport, that it's all building. Here's a question from uh, Nazim uh, about video. Jeff C is an expert in this, and he tips on using video. Well, I just happen to have a screen share. Um, <laughs> once, once again, once again, Nazim, the same thing is. Uh, thanks for asking the question, by the way. Is um, repurpose everything. I see people who take, they take the time or expense to create a video, and then they throw it up on YouTube, and that's it. Man, put it everywhere. Here's an example. I yeah, I use this in my the beginning of my show. It's a little commercial about going and doing it on iTunes. But I have it on uh, my pinned to my uh, Twitter page. If they go to my profile, that's there where they can watch it. It's um, I made a 15 second version of it that I share on Instagram. So there's there's all sorts of things. If you're gonna do a video, man, do take the time, split it up. You know, you got Instagram 15 seconds, uh, Twitter is 30 seconds, and so. Even these long hangouts, a a good question and an answer, um, just like Rebecca did with the the answer, is about usually the perfect link for a YouTube video. Slice that puppy up and put it up there. Share it out on Facebook. Upload it natively to Facebook. I know Pagan. Yeah, I was Rebecca, gonna say that. <laughs> I know you guys will talk about that next uh, next uh, session, but yeah, upload it natively to Facebook. But use it as if you're gonna take the time to do it, man. Just Cut it up and use it everywhere. Ring every yeah. bit of content yeah. you can out of that thing. <laughs> yeah, re there's that great, great Gary Vee quote, which I can't remember exactly, but it, you know, squeeze every every bit of juice out of the orange. Like just hustle as he hustle is squeezing every bit of juice out of the orange. That's what it is, and I love that because you do, you know, it takes a long time to make a great video, so use it everywhere. Absolutely. And reuse it. I mean, you know, you don't have to do it once. You could wait a month and do it again. I mean, I, I repost my stuff to, to Instagram. You know, I don't just throw it up there one time. I mean, I'll keep going because I have a new audience always coming mm -hmm. in trying to find out more stuff about me. I've never yet had somebody said, I saw that video. Why are you posting it yet? <laughs> oh, no, especially with how useful your videos are. I can't imagine well, you yeah. have ever heard that. Well, um, a great thing to talk about, though, Jeff, would be just the the extra visual pieces that you create for a YouTube channel would be super helpful because a lot of people might not know. Oh, like for doing the um, like the trailer videos and the and thumbnails. Yeah, the yeah. thumbnails, doing the make sure, and, and I I'm it's always one more thing you have to do. But after you do mm -hmm. a video or hang out, going and making a thumbnail, it's really easy now. But that does mm -hmm. give you more traction and going back in and optimizing your descriptions and. Also, when you share a, a video out, if you have already set up like a uh, a film strip or playlist, if you have a playlist, like all my mainly tip interest tip shows are on a playlist. Mm -hmm. Well, if you share that playlist out when you share the video, it won't go to one of those random YouTube things at the end. It will go to your next show, and so you can get some more play mm -hmm. by doing it that way. And so even even your little small little clips make another playlist. You know, for the maybe your small clips and do the same thing where people can just rotate through them. And also, you can create that same type of playlist on Facebook now with their video tab. You can create a whole channel there uh, mm -hmm. with a with an intro video, and you can create little playlists on there. All and and again, share the whole group of them. Um, you know, think about long term when you're creating your video to create a little playlist. Make all your playlists like all the mainly Pinterest just tip ones have the same one. You know, when Jeff does, you know, I don't know, barbecuing for manly men that's right. going to have you know a separate little thing you know when it's 101 ways to do bacon that's going to have a separate thing and that visual <laughs> branding ties them up people are like oh I totally love that last barbecue video I can't wait for the next one the right. visual it, it makes you interested and excited for people's content when it all matches it's like the ultimate compliment which we've already kind of talked about but the ultimate compliment to me is when someone says I saw your image in the stream and I had to click on it because I knew it was going to be good yeah, they, they were excited about my image but what they knew was that it was going to lead to where I really put 
even more work into it. You know, so let's like that's all your pieces working together. So we we challenge everybody watching this to like work on your brand to get to the point where someone says, "I saw that and I couldn't wait to check it out." Mm -hmm. um, it's the ultimate compliment, and and it's your ultimate goal as a blogger is to, you know. Dennis, being a food blogger, that's exactly what people do is they see some amazing image. You better have the recipe and some good, you know, good tips on how to make that. Well, and I think with that challenge, I would say uh, make sure you're connected to Andrea because she does uh, a roundup every Saturday of all the top visual strategies. And so you will just get a, a wealth of information from all, all the articles that she highlights. So a really great place to start. Thanks for that. Yeah. And also, I wanted to. I also wanted to add though that I think we can all agree when you come to the table and you have all this consistency in your images and you and you keep doing things, people take you more seriously. I mean, if you're going to only do it half-ass and you're only going to do it here and there, consistency and familiarity is not going to come. But I'm also not going to really take you that seriously. I mean, we all had to spend, like the pig said, 10,000 hours honing, tweaking, testing, and putting in work to learn the things that we needed to learn for our business. If you want to be taken seriously, you have to do that work. And I think visuals is a huge way that we sort of qualify that quality of your brand. You know, when you step up your image game, people are going to take you more seriously and they're going to want to devour your content more because there's that trust and there's that high quality, um, the, the perceived high quality. Sounds good. All right. Well, we are coming to a close of this session. It has been amazing, a lot of information. And I'm going to run down real quick and I want you each to give me one tip for creating visual strategy. For, for having a visual strategy. So let's start with Rebecca. <laughs> one tip out of everything we've talked about? Yeah, one, one, one lasting tip to leave with these people. For Jeff, I am getting serious feedback from you. I yeah. think it's, it's everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. I just, <laughs> if we're going to run down, it's going to be really hard. Um, for me, it's going to be uh, keep it simple. So for my website, I create one image that shares perfectly uh, across every social network. And uh, what I mean by that is my text is perfectly positioned so that when it tweets out, it looks correct where you can actually see that within the stream. So make it simple on yourself. Find a template that uh, works across all social networks no matter what that looks like, uh, no matter how it shows up, so that you could just go in and you could build this out within Canva, something that every single time you post to your blog or you create a graphic, you can just quickly and easily go in there, change up your text, maybe change up that background image, um, and, and just drop in your new title to your blog post, and then off you go. So it's it just it shortens up the amount of time you have to spend creating those images over and over and over again. Great, thank you, <laughs> Peg. Oh, one tip is so hard. Um, I would say you know just we've already said it a bunch of times, but the consistency is key. So once you create your formula, stick with it. Stick with your brand palette. Use your logo. You know, it's okay to experiment here and there, but you want to really be consistent. And you'll know when you hit your perfect formula because people will tell you that they love it. Um, and then just kind of go with that and, and rotate, but always be super consistent with everything in your brand style guide. Thank you. Andrea. Well, they That's sort of stole both my tips. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, just to take off of that, though, is really define, spend time and define your branding guidelines. Spend the time. Before you even go to create visuals, make sure that you know exactly what your color palette is and exactly what fonts you're going to use. There's no sense starting before you have those things defined. Very good. And Jeff? No, oh, everything's been taken, but I will, I'll give you a... <laughs> A video power tip. Um, I take the time now, if I'm going to film a video, is to create two uh, call to actions at the end. One for Facebook, because Facebook, you want to upload that natively, and they have a call to action that you can add to the end. And then for YouTube, I always do the, hey, subscribe to my channel, 
and point to like the button where they can do that at the end. So I go ahead and make, when I film a video, film the, the whole thing, and then at the end I split it up and have two different calls to action because those are two big, huge uh, video platforms you don't want to miss. Excellent. Great advice from everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on Visual Strategies on the third annual Virtual Bloggers Conference, and we'll be coming back to you in about an hour with Facebook tips with Rebecca Radis and Peg Fitzpatrick. So come in and learn more about using Facebook. So thanks a lot. I'll see you soon.